The top business stories live from the Sky News City studio. The products of the future will speak to the chief executive of nanomaterials developer Nanoco. Tom Hayes, the first trader jailed worldwide for interest rate rigging, has lost an appeal against his conviction. And I'll be joined live by the chief executive of Wizz Air as the aviation sector grapples with safety and technology issues. Good afternoon, this is Business Live with me, Ian King. Nanomaterials are tiny materials typically between 10 and 100,000 times narrower than human hair. And within them is a subclass called quantum dots, which enjoy size-dependent optical and electronic properties, allowing them to be used in a wide range of applications. Well, a leading player in developing these materials is Nanoco, based in Runcorn in Cheshire. Today, the company, which was born in the chemistry department at the University of Manchester, reported a pre-tax profit of £2 million for the six months to the end of January. That's up from a loss of £2.3 million in the same period a year ago. Well, joining me now is Brian Tenner. He's the chief executive of Nanoco. Brian, welcome to you. Thank you. What are the most promising applications for quantum dots? So we divide them into two different areas. One is in sensing, one is in display. So if you think of anything where a machine needs to see, whether it's a mobile phone looking at your face, whether it's a car moving down the road, whether it's um, a, a robotic lawnmower. So anywhere where a machine needs to see, you can put quantum dots into the sensor and basically you're giving it 20-20 vision or better. But you, you know what I mean. The other area that we look at is on displays. So the classic one is a TV, but if you then think of smartwatches, mobile phones, any kind of display, even in a car, Dashboards of the future will actually be an entire screen going across the, the whole car. That's one of the other applications. And in display, what do these quantum dots bring to the parties? Is it all about improving the quality of service or is it about reducing energy use? Or, or... So the main benefit is, if you think of a modern TV, you want brilliant colour. Quantum dots enable that colour. Um, so the best TVs have got vibrant colour, but also there's no lag. So if you've got fast moving images, you don't get blurring. Um, when you turn uh, a quantum dot off, it goes jet black. Again, some TV technologies, when you turn it off, it looks a little bit grey. Um, the more intense images, the quantum dots are really, really vibrant. They keep the colour the whole time. Uh, so that's the primary goal for it. But the quantum dots that Nanoco uh, focus in, they're cadmium free, so they're non-toxic. Um, and they also are very, very effective at converting one form of energy, so the backlight in the TV, into the new form of energy, the green light, the blue light, uh, the red light that makes up all those colours. You've also been doing some work in life sciences in the past. Is yes. that still on the, on the radar? So that's somewhere that we still have a lot of IP. Because our, uh, our quantum dots, unlike a lot of our competitors, are cadmium free, we, have, we took them all the way through to testing in animals and they were proven to be safe. Um, the last four years, though, until we had a big win uh, last year, um, we were really having to narrow our focus down to a small number of applications. So we still have IP in that space. We actually had a fully functioning uh, COVID test, uh, cancer imaging, and also possibly cancer treatment using quantum dots. But at the moment, it's shuttered. We've still got the IP. We could come back to it. I mean, you mentioned your IP there. I mean, you, you have fought very uh, aggressively in the past to defend it, even against the likes of Samsung. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, people talk about uh, the David and Goliath type challenge, and the truth is 99 times out of 100, Samsung wins. Goliath wins. Um, we, though, had worked with Samsung for such a long time. We were due to be in the TV that they launched in 2015, and we were disappointed when they launched a TV. No licence, no material coming from us, and we tried for a couple of years to persuade them to actually do the decent thing. And in the end, we had to file suit, uh, which was a big deal for a company like us. We had to get third party funders. We ran a competition for that. And we fought probably five years end to end. So it's not a fast process. But we've come out with the biggest TV company in the world with a license to our technology. And you know that's telling a lot of other TV companies, if you want to have cadmium-free quantum dots, maybe you should think about talking to Nanoco. It's pretty amazing. I mean, they're, they're only one of uh, many companies you're partnering with. Another is yeah. ST Micro, the yes. chips giant, who you've just signed a, an agreement with. Yes. What, what will uh, that bring you? So that is about um, sensing materials. So coming away from display, this is now to infrared sensing. So as I was mentioning earlier, whether it's face recognition or machines being able to see each other. And this new agreement is a two-year agreement. 
and it's to develop new, even faster uh, materials. So that if you think of a, an object that's moving, if it sees something, you want to be able to see it quickly, react quickly. So these new materials, faster reacting, I think maybe 100 times faster than the first generation materials. Um, and they're also able to operate at much higher temperatures, which for some applications is really important. How do you think the city should see you? Are you, are you a licensing business in the way that, say, Arm Holdings is primarily? Uh, absolutely not. So we have a production facility. Our sensing production facility can make material for hundreds of millions, if not billions, of sensors. This is all up in Runcorn, um, where our 50 people are based. We've already got that facility built. It's there. On the, on the TV side, we can make material for 2 million TVs. It's the equivalent of about 80 million phones or you know, a few hundred million smartwatches. Um, we've always seen real value to come from us actually being a production company where the real money is to make. Now, if we get to a position where someone decides, I've already got my supply chain, I don't need material from you, but I do want to license your technology, then fine, we'll talk to them about it. But we're absolutely not an IP licensing company. Good to hear. Brian, lovely to talk to you this afternoon. Thanks okay. for joining me. Thanks very much. Cheers. Some other business news stories for you now. And the Bank of England's Financial Policy Committee said this morning it's looking into the risks posed to financial stability by the private equity sector. The committee said higher interest rates have made it more difficult for private equity funds to raise investment, contributing to downward pressure on asset valuations, while default rates on debt linked to private equity have increased. The FPC also said the overall risk environment remains challenging, but noted that so far UK borrowers have been broadly resilient to the impact of higher interest rates. It added that the UK banking system is well capitalised with the ability to support households and businesses, even if economic and financial conditions were to be substantially worse than expected. Tom Hayes, the first trader jailed worldwide for interest rate rigging today, lost his appeal against his conviction. Mr Hayes, a former star trader at City and UBS, was convicted in 2015 of conspiring to defraud by manipulating the London interbank overnight rate, uh, LIBOR, a major network benchmark. It was re he was released in 2021 after serving half of an 11-year sentence. But the Court of Appeal today dismissed his appeal and that of Carlo Palombo, a former Barclays trader who was convicted in 2019 of rigging LIBOR's Euro equivalent Euribor. Speaking outside the Court of Appeal, Mr Hayes said he would continue his appeals process. I'm bitterly disappointed by the decision today. Um, I think we really believed and hoped uh, we really believed and hoped that the decision would be different. Um, they've given us the opportunity to make submissions, to have the points certified so we can take it up to the Supreme Court. Uh, my legal team will do that, as will Carlos. Um, and we can only hope that they see fit to allow it to be heard at the highest level here. We've tried four times previously to get it heard at the Supreme Court. The UK remains an international outlier in relation to um, the definition and operation of LIBOR. The supermarket chain Morrison said today that customers were starting to notice it was improving after reporting an acceleration in its sales growth. Morrison said that in three months to the January the 28th, its group sales, excluding fuel and VAT, were up 4.6% on the same period last year on a like-for-like -like basis. That's the measure that strips out the impact of new store openings and refurbishments. Well, that was the strongest like-for-like -like sales growth for three years and completed a seventh straight quarter of underlying sales growth. Now, Monday's boardroom clear-out at Boeing following the groundings of its 737 MAX 9 jet, which is playing havoc with summer flying schedules in the US and Europe, is affecting the likes of Ryanair and Southwest Airlines, among others. But while Airbus has streaked ahead of Boeing in terms of orders, it too has seen aircraft grounded due to issues with its Pratt & Whitney engines. Well, among those affected is Wizz Air, which has an all-Airbus fleet. Much well, joining me now, I'm pleased to say, is Joseph Ferradi, the founder and chief executive of Wizz Air. Joseph, great to see you this afternoon. Thank you. I think 20% of your flight w was grounded. How quickly are you working through this? Yeah, exactly. So, as you can see, supply chain has become really problematic in the industry on all fronts, you can imagine. Uh, we try to mitigate all of that uh, by extending the operations of existing aircraft, uh, continuously taking new aircraft deliveries uh, from uh, Airbus. Even we are taking some market leases uh, to make sure that we are protecting capacity. As a result, we are expecting our business to remain at least flat uh, in the coming year uh, in, front, in front of us. But it is a significant issue we are, uh, we are processing. 
But, but it doesn't sound, from what you've said there, so you've had to make root and branch changes to your schedules. Yeah, we have been remanding some of our schedules, but again, overall, we are protecting our capacity and we are not dropping uh, the line. So we want to make sure that we continuously uh, uh, offering our services and seats to our customers and we remain competitive in the marketplace. Now, you've spoken in the past about uh, widening the size of the fleet to 500 aircraft. Is, is that still a, a target? Uh, it is, and uh, we are on track with regard to new aircraft deliveries, but now, I think the next 12 to 18 months will be uh, challenging. Uh, we have to go through this uh, engine uh, removal process, uh, engine inspections uh, by the manufacturers, but once we are uh, putting that uh, behind us, I think we've got to be back on track to, uh, to 500 aircraft. Now, I mentioned your schedule just then. How, how's it looking this summer in terms of forward bookings? It's very strong. I don't think there is any issue with, uh, with, the, uh, with the consumer. I mean, I used to say that, uh, you know, in the past, I was very much focused on trying to grab the consumers and didn't really worry, worry about the, um, uh, uh, the supply chain. Nowadays, it's all the other way around. Uh, the consumers are there, but we, uh, we have to, to do a lot of work on the uh, supply chain. So demand is strong. I think people still want to travel. What's the sales mix going to be this summer between the actual cost of the uh, ticket and ancillary charges like uh, baggage fees and so on? We try to be as low cost as possible, as low fare as possible. This is the essence of our business model because by applying low fares, we are able to stimulate the market. And you know, in many places, I mean, not only in the United Kingdom, but uh, just imagine us in Central and Eastern Europe, we are still getting first flyers into the franchise, uh, franchise of flying. So keeping fares low uh, is essential for the, uh, the business. I think overall, on an industry basis, probably there is going to be a slight increase. I mean, some of the costs are creeping, fuel is creeping, all these supply chain issues are affecting the cost of, uh, of, the, uh, of the industry, but we are trying to differentiate ourselves by keeping fares low. Now, we've talked a lot in the recent past about your network. I mean, you're still building that out, in particular to Saudi Arabia. What, what's so interesting about that market? Well, I think Saudi Arabia is on the rise. Uh, many ways, you, uh, you, you, you look at that country, that country is being transformed uh, society-wise, economy-wise, um, and uh, we think, you know, we can be part of that, we can create value, people want to travel uh, to Saudi Arabia, from Saudi Arabia, and we can, we can create that infrastructure for the country. Obviously, uh, there, are, there are some pretty well-established local carriers there. You're not worried about uh, competition in that part of the world? We are not worried about anyone. Uh, we think <laughs> we can bring in a unique proposition to the market to, uh, to people who want to who wanna travel by our very low-cost uh, operation. Uh, as a result, we can um, create uh, unique offerings to the, uh, to the market and stimulate the market and getting people into the franchise of flying, essentially. Obviously, there's a lot of business travel to Saudi Arabia. What, what about leisure? I mean, as a country, they are pushing it hard, but a lot of people are, are quite sceptical about it. What would you say to them? I think we are seeing a mix of travel profiles uh, developing in, uh, in Saudi Arabia. Uh, the country is prone to, uh, to leisure. I mean, it's a beautiful country. Uh, they have a lot to, uh, to offer. They, they will need to create the infrastructure for, uh, for, for that, but they are on the way uh, to, uh, to establish that. But also, you are seeing a growing middle class uh, in the country uh, who are very interested uh, in exploring Europe, exploring other parts of the world. So I think it's a very balanced uh, traffic, business, leisure, inbound, outbound, as and also migration traffic, you know, serving the, uh, uh, the country's industries. Yeah, and which are the other key priorities for you in terms of routes that you're, you're expanding on and putting on more capacity this year? Well, we are in the business of opening new routes uh, and expanding the, uh, the footprint of the, uh, of the network. Um, we find uh, the East uh, very, uh, very exciting. Uh, we are clearly seeing a shift of uh, tremor demand uh, to the East, to the Gulf countries, but also Central Asia, Turkey, um, uh, but also we are feeding capacity in our um, European market. So we, we think actually demand is pretty balanced and pretty strong. Yeah, is the uh, European Football Championships going to be uh, a driver of sales for this year? Yeah, I think there are two major events, the uh, uh, Euro 24 as well as the Olympics in, uh, in Paris. I'm, I'm personally very excited. I'm uh, quite, quite a big fan of uh, soccer and uh, sports overall. And we as an airline are very excited because we think that uh, we actually can serve these events very well. Great stuff, Joseph. Always good to see you. Thanks for joining me today. Thank you. Still to come here on Business Live, we'll have a look at how the markets have done this Wednesday afternoon. Stay with us. When, you know, thinking of a challenge of this magnitude, I wanted to, you know, do it for a cause that was really, really close to my heart. When thinking of issues to money raised for, I thought, 
male suicide is just, you know, at the moment, it's a really, really big issue in this country. You know, the biggest killer of males under 50 in the whole of the UK is suicide. And almost 75% of suicides are all male. So when thinking of this challenge and, you know, the potential to fundraise, I thought, men's mental health, brothers in arms, this is perfect. Being from Scotland, uh, it's not often that we get to international tournaments. So when we qualified for the Euros in the summer of 2024, I thought, right, how am I going to get there? I've always had a sort of passion for travel and, you know, exploring. So when the idea came across me to walk from Hamden to Munich and I thought of the potentials to raise funds, I thought, I need to do this. You know, when you get down a rabbit hole, when you just think, I need to do this passion project. So that's exactly why. And, you know, the kilt is a historic symbol of, you know, Scottish culture and a big tie to the Tartan Army, the, the Scotland fans. I've been splitting my training into two parts, um, keeping up, you know, my weight training, cardio, and just making sure that I'm in sort of my peak, uh, peak physical health going into this, you know, and the second one, the more boring part as well, just getting the miles in, going big long walks, you know, uh, and really just preparing my body for what it's going to endure over the course of the challenge. We start at Hamden, um, where we go over across to Hull, um, from Hull, we get the ferry to Rotterdam, Rotterdam down to Belgium, into Luxembourg, and then across to Munich for the final stretch. Traveling is not just about the destination. It's also about how you get there. Fly Emirates, fly better. Fly Emirates, fly better. Thank you. Well, equity markets uh, this afternoon in Europe have finished to the upside. Here's the picture. All of the main indices in uh, mainland Europe finishing higher. The uh, Ibex in Madrid claims the yellow Legia jersey. That's up by more than 1%. The big corporate story today on continental Europe concerns the fashion retailer H&M. That has risen by 16% in Stockholm after its quarterly operating profit came in ahead of expectations. Well, here in London, the FTSE 100 has finished at more or less break-even uh, this afternoon. The leading blue-chip gainer is DS Smith. That's risen by some 7%.
Look at that, 10 per cent. That must have been a bit of a closing auction uh, bump there. The company confirmed a story uh, overnight by my colleague Mark Kleinman that it has received a £5.72 billion takeover approach from the US group International Paper that uh, trumps an existing offer on the table from the domestic rival Mondi. Also up strongly in the FTSE today is the distributor Diploma up just under 9.5%. It announced a £236 million acquisition this morning that has been well received. Outside the FTSE, Ithaca Energy is up by some 3.5% on news of plans to buy the Italian giant Eni's oil uh, business in the UK, while the gold miner Endeavour Mining has uh, finished up some 5% on a trading update. Meanwhile, SoftBank, the uh, IT services group, that has risen by nearly 1 and 3 quarter percent. It received a push today from one of the brokers. To the downside, the fluid storage maker TI Fluid Systems has fallen by more than 15 and a quarter percent. That's on the big sale of shares by a major investor. Meanwhile, Sir Martin Sorrell's digital marketing group S4 Capital, that's fallen by 9% on a trading update. Sir Martin also playing down takeover talk that was published earlier this week by the Wall Street Journal. Over on Wall Street itself, where the S&P 500 has opened to the upside, the Nasdaq didn't, as you can see, it is now in positive territory. Talking points this afternoon include the drugs giant Merck, that's risen by 3 and uh, we're nearly 4% right now. That's after the US Food and Drug Administration approved its new treatment for a rare lung cancer disorder. On the foreign exchange markets, well, the big story today has been the yen. That's fallen to its lowest level against the US dollar since 1990. Elsewhere, all the uh, currency pairs you can see on your screen have barely moved today. The oil price, meanwhile, yesterday gave back all of Monday's gains. It's now on course for a fall on the week so far. A barrel of Brent crude will currently cost you $85.82 a barrel. That's off a little under half of 1%. Well, joining me this afternoon is Lucy Coots. She's the investment director at JM Finn. Lucy, great to see you as ever. Um, let's start with Diploma. Uh, not a company that a lot of people would have heard of, but it's a real stock market darling. It really is. It's got a great management team, a long track record of success, and they're buying peerless in the US. It's going to expand their US offering and also scale up their offering in the EU. And this is a fasteners business, predominantly for the aerospace industry. And with a 10-year backlog in aircraft build, and there are 1 million fasteners per aircraft, so investors love this. This is why you're seeing the share price response that we have today. I mean, it's, we're so used to US companies buying British, but it's quite rare for it to go the other way these days. What, what have Diploma's management got that makes them effective stewards of these businesses? Because they are quite acquisitive. They are very acquisitive. Th these, they identify businesses that complement their, um, their current sort of suite of uh, divisions, and this one fits within their own aerospace one. Um, it's got 30% operating margin. It's seen 9% compound annual growth from Peerless, so it fits beautifully. And they have a long track record of absorbing businesses by acquisition and making them work. That's execution risk, but they do it very well. Yeah, we have a few in the FTSE that are good at that. Harm was one, Bunzel is another, I guess. Yeah, and Discover IE and all these businesses where you've got the proven management skills, but they tend to leave the businesses alone to do what they're good at. And that's the key to, to the success of integrating businesses within the current well, that's one British company that's uh, buying a US rival. Here's DS Smith is one that looks like it might go the other way. Yeah, so we've got Hunter and Prey in the same water. DS Smith, it's had a bid from International Paper. It's at a premium to where Mondi is. That's the story you spoke about earlier. International Paper bid actually for Smurfit Kappa in 2018. That was rejected. So it's feeling a bit sore. It's number two because Smurfit itself is, is merging with West, Westrock in the US mm. and they're going to be the world's largest. Yeah. So they're, they're looking to make themselves big again. Rather sad, though, to see these European companies essentially sort of being consumed by their US rivals. Yeah, exactly, because we know Smurfit is going to list, actually, in, mm. on the New York Stock Exchange. And obviously, you know, international paper, if it absorbs, uh, you know, DS Smith, will see likewise. So these names are going to disappear. But I suppose that's sort of emotional sentiment rather than anything else. Yes, uh, money talks at the end of the day, doesn't it? Now, there was a, a big agreement yesterday concerning Visa and MasterCard that's uh, got a lot of investors interested. Yeah, so they're stopping their swipe or inter interchange fees. And this is something that actually um, they set, but actually it's the, it's the merchants who... They don't have to pass it on to you and me, the consumer. So this is going to be saving about $30 billion over the next five years. That's massive. And it's going to give a lot more pricing flexibility uh, for sellers. 
What will it mean for consumers, I guess, is the question people will have. It is. So it depends which card you carry. And this is by... So the issuer, it will determine what charge you're going to, be, you're going to have. So I think we might see more dynamic pricing at the tills, which will be interesting. OK. I mean, where, where does this leave the competition with the likes of Stripe and all these other emerging payments businesses? I don't think it's particularly going to affect them. I think it's really going to affect the issuers. There was a little initial concern about Visa and MasterCard. They're the duopoly, really, in, in the road rails of how we pay for goods and services now. But I think for the likes of PayPal, Stripe, it's, it's not really going to affect them. It might even benefit them, actually. Oh, that is interesting. Lucy, always good to see you. Thanks very much for joining me this Thank afternoon. You. Well, that's it from me for this afternoon. I'll be back, of course, uh, with Business Live tomorrow morning at half past 11. Coming up next, it's a news hour with Mark Austin. But before I leave you, I'm going to show you some pictures here. The uh, technology behind a European flying car has been sold to a Chinese company. The air car was first shown off during a test flight in 2021. It can drive on ordinary roads, but it also has fold-away wings for when the traffic gets too heavy. It has to use a runway, as you might imagine, but it can take off and uh, fly at 120 miles an hour. It was invented by and developed by Stefan Klein of Klein Vision in Slovakia and has a flying range of 600 metres. Its technology licence has now been sold to a Chinese company for rollout there. A fascinating story and one we shall uh, continue to watch with interest. Not sure I fancy uh, flying that in high winds, I've got to say. See you tomorrow.